Well, hello, welcome everyone. My name is Esme. I'm a member of the Firestorm Cooperative, and I'm so thrilled to be introducing this conversation between two phenomenal authors, Anjali Njeti and Gayatri Seti. Uh, I'd love to say a little bit about Firestorm before I introduce our guests more. We are a 13-year-old worker-owned bookstore and event space operating out of Southern Appalachia uh, on Cherokee land. We specialize in books about feminism and social movements uh, and politics, but we also have all kinds of different books. We even have a pretty extensive children's section. Pre-pandemic, our community space was a hub for organizers and activists uh, to hang out and share information and knowledge. And we've tried to continue that as much as possible virtually during the pandemic by having these free events uh, for folks to get together and talk. Uh, we uh, have even been able to get a lot of folks who may never have been able to make it to the space in person, which has been kind of a cool byproduct of this whole thing. Uh, last week, we made a really exciting announcement that after a full year, over a full year of closure to browsing, we are going to be reopening to limited weekend hours, which is super exciting. Uh, we're going to do that at the end of May. Uh, and I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who has supported us over the past year, either from buying books or just sending us words of encouragement. Uh, it has meant so much and we're really excited to reconnect with folks in person really, really soon. So again, a uh, big welcome to our guests, Anjali and Gayatri. Uh, Anjali is a former attorney and award-winning journalist based out of Atlanta. She recently put out two books from two different publishers less than a month apart, which is an incredible feat. Uh, the first one, Southbound, is a collection of essays centered around South Asian identity. Uh, the second is called The Parted Earth. Yep, oh, we've all got it here. <laughs> um, the second is called The Parted Earth. It is a really beautiful novel um, around the rippling effects of partition between India and Pakistan in the 40s. I'm currently in the middle of it right now. I was reading it for several hours today uh, and it is absolutely gorgeous. And it made me so excited that I get to meet the author tonight. How cool is my job? <laughs> um, and then I couldn't think of a better person to be in conversation with Anjali tonight than Gayatri, uh, who besides being a very dear friend of mine is an educator and writer also based out of Atlanta. She's previously done an event with Firestorm where she's brought her extensive expertise in children's literature, which she also shares on her Instagram page, Desi Book Auntie. And her debut book, Unbelonging, is coming out from Mango and Marigold Press later this summer. We will definitely be doing an event uh, with Gayatri to celebrate that release. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, so before I turn things over to Anjali and Gayatri, I just wanted to say that we'll, we'll be posting some links in the chat to purchase these books if you want to support the authors and Firestorm. Uh, for every copy of Unbelonging that's sold, we are donating a copy to students and educators, which is really exciting. Uh, so I'll drop those links in the comments. Uh, and then I will also be keeping an eye out for the Q&A. So I'll pop back in sort of at the end of the conversation to bring your questions into the discussion. Uh, thank you both again so much for being here uh, with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm so excited to see where this conversation goes. Thank you so much, Esme, for having us. Um, this has been uh, many months in the planning, uh, right, Anjali? We, we imagined yeah. that we'd be doing a book event, you know, many months uh, before the book was even in final manuscript stage. We were like, we will do some book events together. And here we are. Uh, what a beautiful thing. This feels oh. like, this feels okay. like the apex of this experience writing the novel because you were so involved in it. So I just feel like this is the event to, to it, it symbolizes so much for me. So thank you so much Firestorm Books and Ash and Esme for setting this up and Guy Three for uh, arranging this for us to be in conversation because in a lot of ways, you're the, the perfect person for me to talk to about the book because you were so involved with it. Uh, with both. And I'm just so delighted and honored. So how about we get started first in sort of situating ourselves in time and place. Uh, all of us are in the South and we're Southbound in many ways. So I thought maybe we could get started with that book and then travel across the globe and then back again. How about that? 
sounds perfect. Your journey yes. are in conversationally through the themes that link both the books, uh, but we'll begin with Southbound. And, you know, by way of introduction to yourself, you have several essays in this um, collection that answer the questions, you know, what are you, who are you? And some of those questions are weaponized. And I wanted to throw those to you to, to maybe paraphrase some of the essays in, in answer. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I've spent, like many people, I, I don't think I'm uh, unusual in this way, but like many people, I've spent many years thinking about how I identify. And um, my thinking has shifted as I've grown older and become a little bit more mature and understanding of a lot of different forces in this world. Um, but basically, I felt for a really long time that I did not have the agency to define my identity because it was always I, it, it was always uh, captured by outside people, right? It was always questioned. It always seemed too uh, unusual for them. Um, I was othered by it. Um, I, you know, I was on the receiving end uh, of, of racism. Um, and so I couldn't really, I didn't really have the energy. When you're in such a defensive posture of your identity, it's very hard. It was hard for me to then gather the energy I needed to see who I was for myself. It was almost like I couldn't even imagine myself with everyone else so vocally and visibly expressing what they thought I was and where they thought I should fit in the world. Um, so that was really challenging for me. And I didn't even know well until well into adulthood that I was struggling with this because it just was so normalized for me. Um, and I always felt like I was inconveniencing other people with my identity, that, that, that I was, you know, of course people could ask, but usually it was more pester um, or, you know, condescend about my identity because I'm too confusing. Um, uh, and so it took me a while to realize that the, the hurt and the humiliation and the pain that I felt from that sort of uh, questioning, it was often done publicly, you know, in a group of people, it was done at my workplace, it was, you know, it was done at doctor's offices. Um, I mean, gosh, it recently happened actually at a doctor's office. And I was there for some, some uh, health issues I was having. And these two white men kept going back and forth about what I was. And it, I was already sick and needing an assistance of, of help and trying to understand some health issues I've had recently. And I just thought, gosh, I just, it's, it's, uh, it, it's been a struggle for me to assert myself and my authentic identity. And it really continues today. Um, so what I realized though, is that my identity could be a vehicle for activism. It could shape social change. And this works well for me because not only do I feel so much more secure in my identity, when I'm working with multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious coalitions of people, when I have when I am one of many people working towards the same goals, um, it makes me feel more like myself, and it makes me feel like I can assert my true self. But also, uh, it is just a, a healthy reminder that there are have always been people from the beginning of time. Um, struggling with this issue, and that I have a lot I can learn from them, and 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 I can build friendships with them, and understand how they move through the world, and they make sure that they are seen for who they are, um, and and doing the work, doing organizing work, social change work, has really put me back together in a way that I didn't think would ever happen. I mean, I feel like I had sort of just a jigsaw puzzle with parts of me scattered everywhere. I've never felt more whole than I have since I started activism, since I really threw myself into it. Um, 
and uh, and more recently became an organizer, but it, it took me time. And so I hope this book makes people feel really empowered by their identities and helps them find a coalition or a community for them to connect with so that if they want to dismantle white supremacy, they have people who will no longer, who will no, not only um, help them do that work, but also hold them accountable um, and work in community with them. Um, and, and I hope this book sort of serves as, as a guide about how, how really wonderful it is to do social change work, um, especially if you're struggling with how to move through the world um, based on how people have always told you who and what you are. I, I found that the journey through the essays took us exactly on this path that you beautifully just, you, you just gave us an overview of, of all of the essays and the, the ground that you cover because at the very end, it made sense how the question, what are you? Towards the end, you are now, you flipped it and you say, who are you? And then you answer it. And I, I almost cheered as I was reading. I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, when you can answer the who are you with all of the qualifiers and additives and taking up the unapologetic space, then that's the place from which you do your activism. That's the space from which that identity leverages into social change and you show us that. So beautifully in these essays. I love how you link all of the essays together. There's like a thought pattern behind all of that. And it became really obvious for me as I was listening to you speak now, because it just was like, oh yes, those are the links. So who are you? You know, I, I, I feel very comfortable with many, many uh, identity markers. I, I think the term that I gravitate towards most easily because I am mixed race is brown. I'm a, I'm a brown cis hetero woman. Um, I'm mixed. Um, I consider myself um, South Asian, uh, Indian from South India. Um, and I consider myself a, 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 a Puerto Rican and Austrian, which is the, my mom's side of the family. Um, and, um, I am also a Southerner. I mean, I came of age in the South. I have always since, you know, a couple years after I moved down here uh, at age 10, I moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee, couple, I felt very Southern. I went to college in the South. Um, I, you know, I went, uh, to various other States for a while, but I've now lived in the Atlanta area for 14 years. I feel Southerner. Um, so, um, and, and of course, I'm also, uh, I, I suffer from chronic illness and chronic pain. Um, that defines me as well. Um, I write a little bit about that in the book. Um, I am a, uh, a mother, a daughter, a sister, a, a wife, an aunt. Um, and, uh, I, and I'm so lucky to be a friend to so many people. Um, and, you know, I... Who knows what my, uh, the wonderful thing about identity is who knows what identities I will embrace in the future, right? Uh, you know, these are fluid things. They change uh, as, as people's communities change, as people grow and, and into uh, new and different people. But that's what I, that's where I am today. I love that, every bit of it. And I embrace you in, in the expansiveness of who you are and how you show us that expansiveness in these essays. You know, what really struck me, especially with the title of the book being Southbound and what you just said about being a Southerner is that many narratives about the South do not include people like us, mm -hmm. uh, brown people, brown Southerners mm -hmm. um, uh, who have immigrant parents or who might be immigrants themselves. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to hear a little bit um, about how your essays are an offering that uh, expand the notion of what it means to be Southern. Absolutely. I mean, so uh, I came of age in Chattanooga. Uh, we, I moved there when I was 10 years old. And 
There were some very small immigrant communities. Um, there were some South Asians, but not many. There were some Arab folks, but not many. Um, some Persian folks, um, some folks from uh, uh, Southeast Asia, some from Africa, but everybody was so small that I was the only brown person in my entire fifth grade class, in my entire sixth grade, uh, I mean, entire grade in my entire fifth grade entire sixth grade so it was a lot of a lot of kids and I would see a couple of like in the entire school there would literally be three or four brown kids of a school of several hundred um so you know I uh, I didn't feel like we existed there um in, in the south it didn't feel initially like something that I was a part of um but over the decades, uh, we have rapidly grown in population and we have become the very fabric of the South. Um, there are many of us now, uh, not just in you know, metropolitan areas like Atlanta or Charlotte or Houston, Texas or uh, El Paso, we are also in those really tiny towns in between. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we are everywhere in the South. We are just as much as the South as uh, anybody who's claimed to be here for generations. And, you know, some people have been here for many, many generations. Um, so we've got a different story down here. And, um, you know, it, it was discouraging not having many models as a young person in the South of, brown southerners. I mean, you know, I would see a few in the community, but didn't see them in the newspaper, didn't see them on television, um, you know, didn't, didn't really know where many of them lived. And so um, it was hard. It's, you know, when you don't see a lot of people that look like yourself, it's kind of hard for you to even see yourself. And I think that was a, a problem for me is that I really just needed to know that I existed and seeing other people, other brown people, it really didn't even matter, you know, what ethnicity the brown was. I would just see a brown person and I would feel, you know, whether or not they were Arab or Latinx or um, whatever, I would just see another brown person and be like, oh, you know, here we are. <laughs> but now we have hundreds and hundreds of different ethnicities who've been living in the South for several decades. So the South has changed. And so um, I wanted to write this book. I wanted to write a Southern book. Um, we have many brilliant uh, brown Southern writers who are writing, yourself included, writing anything from nonfiction to fiction to short stories. Um, and, um, and I'm so grateful to be a published writer in this era when I feel like we are finally being seen. I mean, up until a few years ago, I've been reading books by Brown authors in the South for a while, but it wasn't even until a few years ago that I came across my first book that actually dealt with the Southern experience that actually really confronted what it meant to be Brown in the South. Um, and that was Baby Luscar's The Atlas of Reds and Blues. And so, you know, here I am in my 40s reading this book and thinking, wow, this is a book about brown Southerners and what it's like to be brown in the South and um, what that experience means and how this shapes their day-to-day -day life and their identities. So um, so yeah, so I'm, I feel like this is the dawning of a new era and that we are all now coming out with these books about being Southern, whether or not we use that term, but just being from the South and how that has shaped who we are. Um, so it's just, a, it's a, been a beautiful thing to witness. It, it's one of the many reasons I, I feel very drawn to both your books is the situatedness, right? Because you, you do talk about an expansive definition, but you also situate very strongly in tropes in experiences and in incidents in events. Um, and the chapter on in the extreme really stood out to me. Um, there were several places when I read that where I literally had to stop and just really process what you had written in 
uh, bold truth. Um, and one of the parts was where you talk about um, the politeness culture of the South and how you aspired to it and how you didn't realize until recently uh, the uh, brutality underlying the politeness culture. And I want to talk a little bit more about that um, because it's something that continues to be part of my daily existence, right? We live in the South with a lot of yes. white politeness. And when I express to people that behind the come on in y'all, there is uh, there is some white violence. Uh, I have a lot of work to do in explaining and I would love to hear your words so that I can you know, carry them with me because there will be a time I will need them. <laughs> and maybe those listening in as well. Yeah, and I can't promise you that any of my words will work, but I will, I will, I will talk it out with you for sure. Uh -huh. So I, uh, you know, manners are this entire culture in the South. And it wasn't really that familiar to me when I moved from a suburb of Detroit. I, we, we were decently mannered people, but they are held to such a extraordinary degree here in the South. And a, a lot of that has to do with, with whiteness. Um, it's a very racialized view of what manners are. Um, and so what I saw around me was I was already feeling like I didn't fit in and I didn't belong and I was being othered and I was being racially taunted. So what I thought the escape was as a child and as a young adult was, okay, just have impeccable manners and, and you know, don't confront people, for example. Um, don't question in that certain tone of voice. Um, and, and perhaps that will lead to acceptance, right? This was the formula that I had put together in my head. It's the only thing that I could try to make sense out of. And um, the, the people that modeled that the best, um, in my mind, were the evangelical Christians. And, and I was surrounded by evangelical Christianity in Chattanooga. Uh, I mean, all of us were. It was a, it's a very, at least then, not as much now, but it was a very heavily evangelical Christian community. So, um, so I, I aspired to that because it, to me, that was like, this is how you will get out of your otherness is you will, you will mimic these manners you will use these, um, you know, you will use these mottos and these sayings that are very violent, but you will use them in a way that doesn't, that, that people won't know they're violent, right? So I never said something like, uh, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. I, I knew that was bullshit from the beginning, but that's an example of the sort of, you know, the, the violent ideology that was couched in like this, toxic and hateful love, right? But it wasn't love. Um, it's not what it was at all. So it was hard for me to separate though that, you know, that to me, you know, calling out people openly was not uh, acceptable. And that, and, and so I would disagree with people, but keep it inside. And I, or I would confer with my small group of friends who also recognized something as racist or sexist or, um, or homophobic. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it's, it's hard to deprogram yourself from it. But what was even harder was to realize that the, the civility the, the manners were really part of a political machine that I didn't really understand or know about, that this was actually, you know, this was, this was just as tied to far right extremism uh, and, and the birth of the far right Republican party in the late seventies and early 1980s, you know, as a politician going around and campaigning for something. That's the connection that I couldn't make. Um, I just wasn't as uh, uh, aware of, of how that was building um, until years later when I could look back and see, you know, the Jerry Faldwell connection, for example, um, and the, the, uh, the Tammy Faye Baker and Jim Baker connection. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my point in that essay was that 
you know, the very sort of quote subtle forms of extremism, which are just sort of these exclusive circles of people that that raise, elevate God to a degree where he is weaponized against people who are, you know, not believing in that religion or just non-believers in general. Um, it, it's just as there as it is, you know, dirt, you know, with, with Trumpers, like there's no, there's no difference. Um, and it wasn't until after Trump was elected, uh, I was still, I was more actively on Facebook than I am now. And friends who I would have never, friends, they're former classmates, they weren't friends really, but former classmates from my high school, who I probably never would have guessed would have voted for Trump in 2016, kind of came out and announced that they voted for Trump. And that was kind of the moment for me where I realized what the speaking quietly about their hatred instead of speaking loudly about it and calling it what it was, that's where that, that's what the result was, was them, you know, finding, figure, feeling that Trump in fact was, was the next Jesus Christ and really, you know, and, 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 and deeming this monster as somebody that would do, uh, do good. So, so uh, it, it, you know, it's an evolution, Guy Three. I mean, I wish I could have put this stuff together in the 1980s. I didn't have anyone around me asking these questions because it was such a popular form of culture and it was so accepted. Um, and um, I mean, I have a line in the book and, you know, it's so true. I had one friend, uh, dear, one of my dear friends from high school who's, uh, who sadly passed away a few years ago. She told me at 13 years old, um, she said she was an atheist. And I, that at the time was the most scandalous thing I had ever heard of, because I didn't even know what it was. She had to explain it to me. But, um, but that, was the, that was the most I heard about, about the faults of, uh, of, of what could happen what can happen if we unquestioningly accept tenets of a religion that really actually strive towards extremism, um, not in ways that are, you know, you know, we think of the capital insurrection, right, is something that's such a dangerous event. Well, well, the quieter events are actually, I think, more dangerous because they're not recognized as being violent. They're not recognized as being white supremacist of, of you know, of, of really killing off uh, minorities. So, um, so I, unfortunately, it just took me a while to, to have that understanding um, and, and to really see the context of what I was growing up in, which was just this acceptance of, of this this uh, well-mannered violence, uh, this really civil violence um, that was touted as as being a, as, as as good character, having really good moral fiber. I, the way you explained it all, with the paucity of words you used in that essay, and yet there was just clear connections in the way that you convey this element of how white supremacy whispers, right? You use that way of explaining it and it does whisper, right? It's not always loud and it's those whispers that harm us. And those whispers are what also, as you say, allow us to be complicit. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my favorite lines in that essay was about being complicit, being like looking at the sun, you can't look too long. <laughs> I'm just going to write this in my journal and just like sit with this for a while. Um, and I think, you know, the educator part of me really feels like this collection lends itself to that, to like having a notebook with it. Um, and each essay you can annotate and have a little notebook. And what I've been doing is like index, like putting in all of these, you know, <laughs> I love it. page markers with notes in them because I refuse to write in books anymore. Um, and, um, you know, I was wondering if there was one particular section that you felt inclined to read for us. 
Absolutely, I'm happy to. Um, I think I'm going to read from the very first chapter of the book, which is entitled, What Are You and Where Are You From? Because I just think it sort of lays out the book um, and gives people a good idea of where I'm going in it. Um, so I'll start there. I'm not gonna read the whole section, but I'm gonna read several uh, paragraphs in it, which I think will give people a pretty good idea. So this is like, I don't know if it's a chapter or a prologue. I actually could not decide before the book was published what to call this. I guess it's kind of a prologue, but it gives you an idea of, of where, the, the, where the book is going and, and what I'm trying to figure out here. What are you? Where are you from? Questions about my identity have echoed in my mind for decades. They have been absorbed by the tympanic membranes of my eardrums and have traveled through the synapses of my brain. Shadows, they have followed me everywhere. When I was younger, peers would scrunch their noses as if the ambiguity of my racial and ethnic background brought with it a sour odor, the emphasis on our jarring, like a siren, a foregone conclusion that I am part alien. What are you? In the slightly less abrasive version, the speaker's voice drops to a lower key. The emphasis shifts to the last word, drawn out as if multisyllabic. Where are you from? And when the answer And the, when the answer is less than satisfactory, because it fails to meet the speaker's exotic expectations, there's the inevitable follow-up. No, where are you really from? My racial and ethnic identity is oftentimes a Rubik's cube to be solved. I am half Indian, a quarter Puerto Rican, and a quarter Austrian. I am an immigrant's daughter and also a daughter of the Deep South. Despite an ever increasingly diverse United States, I remain a perpetual foreigner. Violence, erasure, exoticism, appropriation, these forces can shape assumptions about identity. Beginning in 2014, when the plight of Syrians fleeing civil war blanketed the airwaves, a man working inside my home said without prompting that he could tell I was from Syria. When the United States denounces countries of the Southern Hemisphere, I am Venezuelan or Guatemalan or Mexican. Having ambiguously brown skin makes me an aberration, a visitor or an intruder who can pose a threat to someone's safety, success or security. My own identity began to form after the 1982 racialized killing of Vincent Chin in Detroit and was later shaped through the hostility toward brown people during the Persian Gulf War and after 9-11. For years, my identity was a reactionary state of being. It has taken me time, reflection, and a lot of work to develop a sense of identity that is defined by my own parameters, that drives from an, an authentic self-concept rather than a defensive posture born of stereotypes or suspicion. Of course, identity goes far beyond trauma, pain, othering, and exclusion. It is history, family, traditions, lore, and love. It is celebration of the myriad ways in which we view and move throughout the world. But identity, when it derives from a place of injustice, can transform itself into collective socio-political power. An individual identity can lead to an exterior energy one that brings awareness, agency, and community, one that acknowledges complicity, and by doing so, gives rise to activism and social change. Hmm. Um, there have been some really amazing reviews of both your books, and I wanna congratulate you on, on those. You. And what's coming across for me is, is the same kind of feeling that I have when reading both the books is that they're timely. Uh, there are things happening in this world, and even though the election made it so that people like you made Georgia turn blue, that there's, you know, that there's been shifts, and yet there are new and yet, uh, 
old challenges that have new form. Um, and I'm wondering which of these essays are people wanting to discuss a lot with you? Like, what, you know, like when you're doing all these interviews and like which, which of these essays is seeming to really resonate and, you know, want conversation? You know, sadly, very sadly, the essay that is seems to be most relevant now is the essay about Vincent Chin because of all of the anti-Asian hatred. I mean, I wish that were not the case. Yeah. I, I wrote and turned in this book really before, uh, it was last summer. So it was when anti-Asian violence was just starting. Right. Um, so I could not, I mean, you know, I heard Trump with his racial slurs and other people with racial slurs with respect to COVID, but I could not have predicted the uh, the the, uh, the spate that has continued of anti-Asian violence, the horrific murders we had here in the Atlanta metro area, um, where six out of the eight people who were killed were Asian American women, and it took place at Asian uh, American businesses. So uh, I, I really wish that essay wasn't relevant, um, but um, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, at least people are uh, talking about it. Now, I don't know whether the talk will actually result in some kind of policies or not to change it, but I do remember that um, last summer, and I'm gonna try to find this in the essay itself, Last summer, there was a brutal murder involving um, a, 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 an Asian restaurant in New York City. And three people ended up being bludgeoned to death. And uh, I have it listed at the beginning of the essay. And I remember I kept tweeting about it and tweeting about it and tweeting about it. And no one saw this tweet. And then one tweet, I think, got maybe like 50 likes or something and people retweeted it. But I couldn't believe that such a vicious and brutal crime, which which I, I, three people died for sure. It might have been that a fourth person actually died much later than the crime itself. But I just couldn't believe it was not on the front page of news and that that people people weren't talking about it. Um, but that that made it in the book, and then that's when I had to be completely done with the book. And then, um, but but I, I couldn't have predicted predicted what happened. Uh, and I mean, you know, let's, let's be real. The, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, downplaying or either people are downplaying or they're ignoring what's happening in South Asia right now with respect to COVID. I mean, really, I see so many brown and black people talking about what's happening in South Asia. I still don't see a lot of white people talking about it. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and this is also, uh, uh, to me, it's, it's also anti-Asian violence, right? I mean, if you can just ignore, you know, the mass deaths of people who are dying because of, you know, in, obviously it's because of the government there, but certainly our government here is complicit and governments all over the world are complicit. You know, to me, it's, it's more of the same, this is all anti-Asian hate that you know that is happening globally and so um i you know i uh sadly the essay has become uh more relevant but um but i and and i hope too uh you know that 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 we get some uh justice in in laws or in policies or in court uh i'm not optimistic but you know Years ago, Vincent Chin's family, they, they never received justice. They never received a dime despite an enormous like $7 million, $8 million settlement, um, civil settlement. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm just not optimistic. I, I just think that, that we, we still don't really ask for any kind of uh, retribution or compensation or any kind of making people whole from this kind of violence. I mean, it's true for, for certainly for black people, for, for many brown people. I mean, it's just this endless uh, uh, streak of, of constant violence. Um, and, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope, I hope that what the essay does, the Vincent Chen essay does was 
is show Asians our sort of long history of activism. I mean, it preceded Vincent Chin's death too. Um, but I hope that means more people will become activists and will join with Black and Indigenous folks and Latinx folks who deal with uh, so much more of this violence than, than we do and really get people to speak out about it because, um, you know, uh, not enough people in our community do. I mean, we just, we, we need to be really vocal um, and, and build multiracial coalitions and treat every death, no matter what the background of the person who dies as a, the death of a family member um, and, and get equally as, as enraged and, and motivated and mobilized and try to figure something out because um, this, this isn't going to get better unless, unless we do. We do. And, you know, the, the, the link to our, you know, earlier conversation about the whispers of white supremacy really is clear to me because it really shouldn't take uh, a, a, this kind of a visceral violent act, mm -hmm. which is also debated, by the way, because, you know, supposedly it was an anti-Asian racism that. Right, right, right. right. So, so the, the fact that, that it has to be this extreme to bring awareness, the fact that it's then debated <laughs> really calls to light how our everyday brown, Asian, uh, and, and there are brown Asians, and then there are East Asians, right. and that, that in this vast community uh, that contains multitudes, that our day-to-day -day experiences do contain that whisper of violence, right? Mm -hmm. Like we encounter these not so microaggressions on the regular. Um, and it's not a uniquely Southern issue. You know, I've encountered these in California where supposedly, you know, Asians are well, you know, integrated into society, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really just, I think that I concur with everything you said. And, you know, to me sort of what I wish for is a day when we don't need to debate or need evidence that this is a thing, yes. right? Um, and your essays really do bring to light kind of those subtle uh, ways, right? The bless your heart brutality, <laughs> you know, as you call it. And, and, and to me, you know, much of our suffering doesn't make the nightly news, you know, and that's what I say in my book is, you know, the everyday suffering of brown and indigenous and black folks does not make the nightly news. You're and, absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there is that element of it that you know, those are some of the connections that I've made. And um, before we take a breather and let you stretch and get some water and hydrate, um, I was wondering if you were invited to do a plus one essay, if you had an essay in mind that you would add to make it plus one, you know, because in Asian cultures, you, you know, 20 isn't really a good number. So like when you give a gift, you always give $21. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I used to think it was so like, you know, in my younger years, and now I'm that auntie. That's I like, know, and you know what? It's so funny to be donated to this mutual aid fund. Eleven. <laughs> so true. And I, I sat. I actually sat on that, and about the fact that there was twenty. But I had because I had more essays in the collection, and then I cut them out because it just became a different collection. And then I ended up with the twenty, and I was like, shoot. No. <laughs> but the other essays just didn't fit anymore. So I couldn't make it the 21. So it's so I'm so touched that you picked up on that because that's mm -hmm. something that uh, not many other people would. But so I, you know, it's so funny because um, the world like has been on fire for a while, but the last, you know, the, the, basically the presidential election and the runoff election are not in the book. And, and that's probably... The, the most strenuous and difficult and organizing work that I've ever done in such a short period of time too, because, um, yes. you know, and so, I, I mean, I would love, I would have loved to uh, included an essay about how Asian Americans mobilized for those two elections, because what I witnessed on the ground and I'm not talking even about my work here. I'm talking about what I saw people do who were afraid of COVID, afraid of the, the violence. We, we dealt with so much verbal abuse 
like in-person verbal abuse doing organizing work for those elections. It, I mean, some of it was quite frightening. Um, we were stalked, we were harassed. I mean, it was not pretty. What I saw my comrades do and, and people who were quiet and afraid and, and worried about catching COVID, just, I mean, I just was dumbfounded about how they did this. They, they came out of their shells and they did really hard, uncomfortable work. And they, they, um, they got people to the polls. They, do, they did what they had to get folks to the polls in a way that, that I'd never seen happen in Georgia, even, even in the 28 election. You know, we did very good work in that election as well, but there was something about this election that really made people go all out. And then when we realized that we had another election two months later, and we had to not win just one, but we had to win two. Um, I, I thought, gosh, we're just all gonna collapse. There's no way we can do that again. And people just turned it up. I mean, and, and they held one another up. And I've never seen so much organizing in Georgia by the Asian American community that was so effective mm -hmm. as I had like from, you know, from like September of 2020 through January. Um, and, then, and then when we couldn't stand anymore, we started our state legislative session, which went until March 31st. So we didn't actually even stop after the runoff election. We went right into fighting the state bills that were trying to be passed. One of which was the, is now the law in Georgia for voting, which is just a terrible uh, racist voting law uh, meant to punish us for electing Democrats. Um, and so we didn't really take a break until April 1st. And, um, and uh, I just, you know, and, and it's probably good that that essay didn't have the opportunity to go in because I really think it's gonna take me a few years before with some hindsight, before I can look back and see how monumental these achievements were that Asian Americans did here. Um, and, and these were, you know, it wasn't even just Asian Americans, it was really just Asians because there were people who were citizens and non-citizens and they, they worked just as hard as the voters. And um, I, I just was so uh, amazed by them and so inspired by them. And I could not have kept going if it wasn't for these folks who, many of them with very little uh, organizing or political experience just stepped up to the plate and, and shined. And I thought, gosh, that deserves something, but maybe, maybe one of these other folks will write about it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but I think you will need to. I, I really do urge you to when 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 the two book launch when you know you've had time to process. I urge you to write it. I, I do, especially given what we've just been saying with the rise of anti Asian violence, mm -hmm. or, or rather the rise in awareness about it because it's, it's been there. Um, there's also, you know, maybe a more, more dramatic rise in activism in the same community that's experiencing these things. And I, I feel like there is a link, there's a connection between, you know, in that, because whenever I learn about the civil rights movement, I often am just blown away that the same spaces and places, the indigenous, you know, sort of lands that, that were sort of, you know, the sites of, of settler genocide were also the same places where white violence was so extreme for so, so long, mm -hmm. were also the same exact spaces and sacred lands upon which the civil rights movement was built. And right. there's something there. There's, there's really something about the situational, positional, locational nature of activism. Yeah. I feel like you could really, when you've had time to settle and make those connections, that if you were inclined to write, you know, that essay, I think we would need it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, which is, which is not to dismiss the smaller kinds, right? Like uh, of activism, because, you know, I, we, Georgia has just been the political center of the universe, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, shout out to the people doing the tireless work who are attending city council meetings and school board meetings and 
are, are trying to, you know, uh, are, are doing what is oftentimes considered smaller, but it's not because, it, you know, it's all big, actually, you know, the, the most local activism is sometimes the most important activism that you can do. Um, so, um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I hope people, I hope Asians in Georgia continue to stay engaged and, and that we don't sort of work, wait for things to get so bad before we act. Um, that's the, that's the worry is that how do we make it sustainable? How do we keep going in months where there's not some horrific tragedy for us to mobilize around or an election where so much will be determined? Um, so that will be the, that will be the biggest challenge. Yes. Yes, definitely. Do you need to stretch your body and get some water? Um, I, I will do whatever you would like to do because I've been sipping and I've got water. So if you're good for a break, I'm totally fine for a break, whatever works for you. Um, maybe in the break, I would invite um, Esme to come back and drop some links into the chat box. Um, and also I'll just invite folks to put in some questions for attending. Um, and let's see, I'll just take a sip and then we'll keep it moving. How about that? Sounds good. So I have been wanting to talk to you about this book. It is gorgeous from the, and, and this is definitely one of those where you judge the book by the cover, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> The symbolism, the storytelling, the characters who feel like family members, like people I know, you know, there's just, there's just so much in this novel, you know, so, so someone who, you know, like, I hope you know what a great, fabulous writer you are. Oh, um, thank you. I mean, to be able to write nonfiction essays about the kinds of topics that we have just discussed, and then to be able to write this glorious novel. Um, I don't know of a single book like it. Oh, like so really, sweet. like there's like really there's, there. I, I don't know that, I actually don't believe in comparison. So I always want people to look at each work as its own thing, right? Like sure it can be part of a genre, but I, I there's just this something from the very first time I looked at a draft, right? It wasn't even typeset yet. Mm -hmm. um, I have been in absolute awe of this book. So I'm really delighted that we get to talk about it and share more about it. Um, so tell us a little bit about, without any spoilers, so this is really key because yes. you know, some of the people who are attending are about halfway through. So we're not giving any spoilers. <laughs> you know, tell us a little bit about the story. Um, and anything that you want to share about it. And then I chose some pages I wanted to read to you from it. Awesome, I love that. Um, so The Parted Earth takes place over seven decades, 70 years since the 1947 partition. And there are several characters that we meet at different points in their lives, but the two characters that anchor the story um, are uh, Deepa, who in 1947 we meet, she's a 16 year old girl, she goes to school, she's beloved by her two parents and her godparents. Um, and uh, later on in the book, we meet uh, Shanti Johnson, who goes by Sean. She's 41 years old, she's living in Atlanta, and um, she recently had both a pregnancy loss and her marriage fell apart pretty much at the same time. And what we learn is that Deepa and Sean are grandmother and granddaughter, but they are estranged. They don't have any sort of connection, which makes Sean's life very complicated because Sean is half Indian, her mother, who raised her is a white woman and raised her in Seattle. And uh, Sean's father, uh, who is Deepa's son, um, 
sort of uh, abandoned Sean when she was five years old to move to India. And then five years after that, died there. So Sean not only doesn't have any connection to her Indian family members, she actually has virtually no connection to her Indian heritage. She doesn't know an Indian family member. She has only been to India once. She doesn't know anything about her history. Um, you know, doesn't have even a sibling that she can commiserate with about this disconnection from her heritage and her father and grandmother. Um, and after Sean's pregnancy loss and her, the implosion of her marriage, she suddenly feels the need to figure out her family history and to figure out why her father suddenly up and moved to India when he was five years old, where he would later pass away quite young. Um, and, um, and so she starts a quest to try to piece together her family's history. And part of that means she needs to find uh, Deepa again, who she met one time uh, when Deepa was living in London, when she was on the layover for her first trip to India. So, um, so uh, th this quest is at the heart of the novel. Um, but what I wanted to do was also tell multiple partition stories. Um, it was too hard to settle on one. So there are several other characters whose points of view that we go into who have very different partition stories than Deepa's, who are at different ages, different stages in life. Um, but um, all of them pretty much have trauma from that time. And the book is really about how people hold trauma, how they carry it, and how sometimes trauma leads to people not being able to share what they endured with anyone else. And, and when these stories aren't shared, the descendants like Sean um, don't have any knowledge of this history. Um, and, the, and they also don't know how that trauma from an earlier generation might have actually played a part in shaping their own life. Um, so, um, so I, I mean, I appreciate your compliments on the book. Uh, it means everything to me in the world, um, since you're, you're such a beautiful writer yourself. But, um, but, um, but yeah, I hope, uh, I hope, and the story, whether or not you know anything about partition, will just resonate to anybody who's wondered about their, their ancestry and their pasts and what might have happened to their grandparents or great grandparents or anyone else in their family line that, that they don't know, and that perhaps they don't they, they, they can't connect with their culture or ethnicity or country of origin because they don't know. You know, the connections between the essays and the story really were there. And it was partly in this search for piecing yourself together identity wise, right? That there is a certain unique kind of trauma that maybe we're now beginning to find words and language around that has to do with a disconnection from your own identities. Mm -hmm. You know, that that is a particular kind of trauma and the way that the story lends itself to really, for multiple characters, multiple embedded stories, really coming to terms with the trauma and you know wherever there is trauma there's healing and so there's a lot of healing in this um novel as well and what i was drawn to um is just the insights that i was able to glean uh and connections to my own family's story so both my paternal and maternal families were partitioned and um you know that there that our ancestral homes are now in what's called pakistan and uh, one of the ways that the trauma shows up is a refusal to discuss it. Mm -hmm. And so many people my age or age really are deliberately kept in the dark about what that time period was like and what the implications were for our families. Um, and so for much of my life, I've been on a quest very much like Sean's to understand that, to know who these people were, what their names were, who they, you know, who they were. Um, and I sadly have not pieced together as much as Sean was able to. So 
I, I'm vicariously sort of like <laughs> imagining what that might be for my family and what kind of healing might be possible. So I wanted to um, share with you that one of the characters and stories in here is who I'm going to read to you about. And I want to situate it right here because you'll see why. Back at home, light streamed between the plantation shutters of her living room. She picked up the laptop. Brought, brought it outside, settled on her porch swing. Late May in Atlanta, <laughs> bloomed <laughs> in every patch of grass, every garden, every tree. A carpet of white and pink impatience formed a perimeter along the porch, lined the walkway to the mailbox. The pastel petals of her tulips were weighted with ripeness. Yesterday's soaking rains <laughs> had washed away <laughs> the last remnants of pollen from the car, the mailbox, the pickets of her white fence. The air had a lightness to it again, a buoyancy. She slipped off her slippers, stretched open her toes, felt the air rush between them. She opened her laptop. She was not the most computer literate person in the world, but she had volunteered at her local New Jersey library for 15 years, was accustomed and quite adept, she might add, at finding a needle in a haystack. After several weeks of online research, calls to the Partition Project and two refugee organizations in Lahore and Delhi, and a useless experience with a private investigator who did nothing but try to extort money from her, Sean was on the verge of giving up her research, her search for her grandfather and great aunt. She was ready to throw in the towel. This saddened Chandani in a way she hadn't expected. Sean had discovered Harjeet's story. Returning the favor, Chandani thought, was the least she could do. I love that part and I love Chandani and her Jeet's story um, so much. That was lovely, thank you. I was on mute when I said that the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to sort of call attention to what that spoke to me in terms of like how you describe our life, because literally the rain soaked us. Um, you know, it is late May, sort of mid early May, but, you know, like very much in that sort of the tulips are blooming. Um, and then you try, you journey us in the space of that one page from situating us in this very sensory um, experience of being in Atlanta to across the world um, through a computer. And that is really the existence of so many of us that our access to our culture, our heritage um, comes in that way. Right, we may be in one place on one port swing, you know, feeling the air in one particular humid place, and mentally and emotionally, we're in a completely different place. Um, and I just wanted to compliment you on all of the writing choices that you made throughout the book that were just like that. Um, just, just there, there, just there. There's so much intention in how you tell some very heavy things. Um, and I really did find Chandani's character one who brought, she's almost like that messenger <laughs> that brings Sean like an access point to her culture. Um, and I think you have said to me that you have often been blessed with those kinds of people in your life. And I would love to hear more about that. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, Chandani is, Chandani comes to Sean at the exact time that Sean needs her in her life. They've been neighbors for about a year and a half. And when Sean's life falls apart, she doesn't really know what to do with it. She doesn't know where to go with that kind of grief and pain. Mm -hmm. And Chandani just happens to be there when she sees Sean in such pain and, and steps in. And, um, and then becomes a portal to Sean's culture. Um, and, you know, Sean doesn't really know, right? There are thousands and thousands of different, uh, you know, 
cultures and ethnicities and traditions in the subcontinent, right? And Sean doesn't know specifically anything about hers, but Chandani's like, let me tell you about, about my family. Let me tell you about my connections. And through that, Sean starts to feel connected to that Indian part of her heritage, even though it's not the same as, as Chandani's heritage. She starts to feel like you're talking the language that I've just not really uh, had. And I, I don't mean literal language. I mean, just like you're creating the space for words in a conversation that I've kind of probably wanting to have for a long time, but didn't really know it. And I didn't have the space or the, uh, or the friend. Um, and I, you know, I have many people, uh, as you mentioned in, in my life that, that have done that for me. I, um, growing up mixed race, um, you know, my family sort of sat at an interesting boundary, you know, uh, you know, are we part of the Indian community? Are we not? There were not many other mixed race families. We knew of maybe two when I was growing up. I couldn't figure out where I fit in. Um, and um, had there been a larger Indian population that might've been different. But when I moved to this part of Georgia, there is a huge South Asian population and uh, most of my neighbors are South Asian. And so uh, I am, the past 14 years, I've actually learned more and participated more in various gatherings and events and celebrations than I did during my entire childhood and adulthood before I came here because I just, wasn't ever living in another area where there are a lot of people like us. And also, I think it helps that there are more mixed race people. So we're not as unusual. I think back in the 1980s, people didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know how to integrate us and didn't know if we would be interested in even participating. Um, but I think that's changed. I think there are some more, you know, people, open their arms a little bit more, I, I think. Um, you know, my kids are only 25% Indian. Um, I'm married to someone who is half Latinx, half German. And, um, and so they're even more mixed than I am. <laughs> and um, and uh, they even feel very Indian to, and to only be 25% because of where we are. Um, so, um, so Chandani, in a lot of ways, in the parted earth, is is representative of a lot of the people that I've met here, who are like, you don't know this tradition, that's fine, come, you know, you don't feel like wearing, you know, a sari, just show up, whatever, your jeans and a t-shirt are fine. Um, you don't know what you're eating, that's fine, just, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll make it, you know, we'll make it different for you, don't eat that, eat this instead, like, it's a, it's been a, a really wonderful community for me and for my husband, who's not Indian at all, and for my children, who are only a quarter Indian. Um, and um, and it's and these folks have really helped me connect with my culture in a way that I really couldn't do, whether it was me, whether it was the community I happened to be in at the time, whatever it was things started clicking for me in adulthood when we relocated here. And, um, and uh, Chandani kind of symbolizes that for me. She's a beautiful character and comes, you know, just in this opportune time in the book. Um, and it really, I think, showed me, uh, because I have a little bit of insight into your process, that, you know, much of the process of researching this wasn't just through online databases and looking at the partition project, but that you had real people that you consulted and interviewed and um, at length. Um, and one of the admirable things that you did, even though you could have written this book without any consultants, but you really did have sensitivity readers and authenticity readers um, to look at this work before putting it out. And I wanted to commend you for that choice, but also invite you to share what your thinking was around that. Absolutely. Um, 
Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to acknowledge that um, I'm very, very lucky and privileged and that I can afford to do that. Um, I have been hiring uh, sensitivity editors, authenticity editors, um, since before these books even, for articles, for op-eds, for essays. Um, and um, and um, I feel they're as important as regular editors, like, I, you know, developmental editor. Like in my mind, there's like developmental editing and line editing and copy editing and authenticity editing. And to me, there's not one of them is more important or more necessary than the other. They are all extremely, extremely important. Um, I cannot be the overseer of, of what biases I have. They're too internalized. Um, it's kind of like when you um, read your manuscript for the 80 millionth time and you actually, and you're reading for, for uh, you're proofreading it, but you actually can't even see basic misspellings anymore because you're too familiar with the text to even have your brain notice that something is off, that you've misspelled something, that the punctuation is wrong, that you're missing a word, right? Your brain almost corrects it before you get a chance to see it. And so that's what I feel like an authenticity editor does is your brain has been trained in a certain way for so long that there's not, you, you really don't have the ability ability to see where your biases are or see where you're using, you know, problematic language or where you're even your character is just some kind of stock character that's a stereotype for a particular uh, identity. So, um, so I was extremely lucky. I was really worried about it for this book because you were one of two authenticity editors that I hired. Um, and then um, I still, even though you did such an amazing job, I just thought, you know, despite many, many years of research, I wonder if I should try to find a historian who collects partition stories to do a read through. Because when you read firsthand testimonies that are collected by wonderful archives, like the 1947 partition archive, which I kind of have a, another archive in the novel that's based on that organization. But when you read a lot of firsthand testimonies, especially for particular geographic areas, for people of different faiths, sometimes there are just inconsistencies and you don't know what could have happened. Um, and that's what I was really struggling with. Um, so I, I hired this wonderful research uh, historian uh, named Tiana and she, um, she works out of the Lakshmi Mittal uh, Center at, that, that's part of Harvard University. And she was collecting, I reached out to that organization and they passed me her name and she read uh, all, most of the book uh, that, you know, to any part of the book that took place during uh, any of the partition years, uh, she read. Um, and uh, most of the details I actually got Right. She was like, oh, yeah, here, there's documentary evidence of this and that and that. And um, but, uh, you know, what she did find was so important for me to change um, because she knew she had an overall picture of when certain cities had a lot of strife and so much tumult and violence that it would have been too hard to have some of the things happen. So I ended up backing up the story by two months. Instead of having it, having it actually take place in August, I started in June because it would have been too hard for, for example, Deepa and Amir's relationship to happen. Um, so, um, so this ended up being incredibly crucial because the last thing I wanted was for a survivor to read the book and be like, that couldn't happen. That couldn't have happened that way in Delhi at that time. Things, things were too violent and too hectic um, and, uh, and too, too chaotic. So, um, so she ended up being super crucial too. So, I mean, that's three 
people, right, that I got, and, and these are different than beta readers, right? Like beta readers are a totally different thing. You know, they're looking for, you know, how is the plot working and, and the, are you developing the character as well? So beta readers are certainly so much more, they're, they're also very, very important. But when it comes to editing, it's it's a profession, right? Um, whatever kind of editor you are, you are doing this as a professional. You have done some work to train yourself to get training. Uh, you have an extraordinary a academic background. You're, you're uh, so so people are professionals, and so I can read as a beta reader. I'm, I I can read people's books and give them feedback, and I'm a, I teach in an MFA program, and this is what I do for my students. But I'm not an editor, and I know that limitation of mine as a writer. I, I have no interest in being an editor either, um, but I don't have the skills, and asking me to not have an authenticity editor for the books would be like asking me to like to trust myself to copy edit my book like i would never i would never take on the 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 work of copy editing my own book um or doing line editing with my own book um so so why would i try to read it for authenticity and to and to pick up internalized biases like you know i don't have that skill set i mean i wish i did but i don't um and and i have i you know i've used i mean every time i use an authenticity editor for anything whether it's a, a 600 word piece or a, a a novel or an essay collection the the piece is so much better it's just a higher quality writing um it you know i i i can do a better job of presenting an argument and backing up an argument. Um, and uh, I've always, uh, you know, whenever there's time for me to uh, hire an editor, sometimes like I'll get assigned something and it's due like 48 hours later and I just can't, uh, uh, you know, most editors are just not available at your beck and call. They have a full-time uh, career doing this work. Um, so, uh, but but whenever I have the chance, I do uh, tr try to reach out to an authenticity editor, and my my it really just makes my writing so much better. And I really hope, I really hope this field becomes more mainstream. Like you don't even have to write about other people. If I had just written a book only about someone exactly like myself, I feel like I would still need an authenticity editor. You know, uh, I mean, it's like uh, Sean, just because Sean is half Indian and I'm half Indian doesn't mean I'm going to be able to write that character in a way that's not stereotypical. I mean, to me, everyone needs an authenticity editor, even if it's just a deeply personal essay about yourself. I feel like it's still a vital uh, piece of the piece of the uh, of the editing puzzle. I mean, I think we all need it for all of our work. And I would just love to see staff positions for folks doing the work that you do. And um, I, I just feel like it's such a necessary part of the industry. And it's oftentimes the most overlooked, unfortunately. It really is. I find myself um, having to explain why this is a thing a lot. Um, because I think you really have set the bar. I mean, everything you articulated is not the norm. Um, you know, many authors, even especially authors who think that they're writing from own voices, what you've articulated is that even so, um, you know, it's important to have someone to work with you. Now it has, it, and, you know, you have to kind of cultivate a relationship with that person because, you know, at the stage that I read your work, it was still a work in progress. So, you know, I think that the folks who do this authenticity reading work, editing work, you know, have to build trust with the yeah. folks, the writers, right? Because you want to honor the writer's integrity. You want to honor the intention of the writer. So, you know, I found myself, my process was to read the whole thing through and then I would go back and every three or four chapters, I would send you a long sort of email, okay. um, you know, with just notes, right? Because that, that seemed to be the most transparent way to be in conversation with you. Um, and it's, um, 
invisible labor for the writer and for the the editor as well because that is what makes the book what it is um, at the final stages right where you're finally piecing it all together to make sure that things read and so shifting that timeline I remember that felt like a urgent crisis right to, to be told this close to when the manuscript right. has to be in that this timeline is is wonky um it, it you know it could be a potential crisis but it's also what you were willing to embrace and be like you know what let's fix this let's just go ahead and do this and i just you know want to bear witness to how vigilant you've been throughout the whole writing process um, yeah and you know i totally hear you on critiques that you receive for doing this work like you have to justify <laughs> that you do this work because one of the things that i hear from a lot of people is that they think I'm not confident in my writing because <laughs> they're like, they're like, oh, well, just believe in yourself. I'm like, that is so bizarre. Like, <laughs> like that has nothing to do with like confidence in being a writer and expressing yourself as a writer. This is just like you would hire, you know, at your press, you have an editor, you have somebody who says the sentence doesn't make sense. Like, this is no different than that. But there is this uh notion that writers are experts in their own stories and that you know there's a real conceit there i think um that you know they're th about the ownership of the work this is my story and this is my way of telling it and and you know when you are going to get a book published it's no longer your story the second it's printed like it's it's not it's the world's story and you have to be responsible to your readers and um and i you know there's so much ego i think that writers have that they feel like it's theirs it's mine it's my book it's my this and i and i get that i mean i want people to tell their stories how they want to tell their stories and feel empowered but there's that's different than insisting on not needing professional services to make the book the best it can possibly be. And, and I hope this industry changes. I mean, let's be real. When Mike Pence gets a million dollars for a, an advance for a book, think of all the authenticity editors that Simon and Schuster could have hired for all the books they put out. They put out. I mean, these are you know, we talk about how it's publishing is tough, but financially and not doing well or doing well. Well, there actually is money for these services. And these big houses especially could expend funds on authenticity editors. And, and this would be a different industry if they did. So, I mean, I really hope, um, I'm doing a few pieces for a magazine this summer. And one of the one of the pieces I'm doing is about the importance of authenticity editing. And I, and I hope, I hope people start to really see it for, for what it is, because um, it can really only enrich your work um, and make you a better writer, not just for that piece, but just for your future writing. Because once you start to see where you tend to stray into territory that can be harmful or toxic to a community of people, you, you do notice it a bit more, not just in your writing, but in your daily life, um, in your interactions with people. So um, thank you for doing the work. It's so, so important. I know it's draining as well, and there's a big psychological component to it, but I'm so grateful to you um, because the book is much better because of it. and. Um, and, you know, I hope people are lucky enough to find editors like you because, you know, I don't think people understand what they're missing until they have such a positive experience. And, um, and <clears throat> hopefully more people will gravitate and be a little bit more open-minded and accepting to uh, hiring authenticity editors because to me, a book is really incomplete without it. It's, it, it's been an honor. I mean, I, I feel so, so incredibly just in awe of the book and at every stage, 
really. And thank you. Thank you for including me in the process. I learned so much from it. And just collaborating with you in general has just been a mutually uplifting uh, thing, you know, because we do write in community. I think I think the publish, publishing world, you know, as we know it, often wants us to believe that writers are solo, <laughs> and yet we write in community. You know, there are so there's a whole community, often invisible, of folks that make a book possible. Um, and thank you, thank you for that, and thank you for this conversation. Um, so long anticipated, and I'm just so honored and delighted and thankful to the folks at Firestorm for hosting us. Um, we have just a few more minutes in case there are any questions. I see Esme, um, so I want to hand over to you if you have any questions, Esme, or announcements or wrap up. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, this is such a good conversation, uh, and I wish that we had more time for it. Um, yeah, thank you both so much. This has been incredible. Um, I did want to name that it sounds like a couple of folks had trouble getting into the webinar from a snafu on our end. Uh, but uh, so if you know anyone who wasn't able to make it or couldn't log in for any reason, uh, we are going to send the recording of this event out to everyone who registered and it will be available um, on our YouTube channel as well uh, in a few days. Um, thank you both again so much, um, and I, I cannot wait. I know I'm going to stay up really late tonight finishing the Predator. <laughs> like, couldn't put it down earlier, so I'm like I'm preparing for a late night, but like the best kind of late night. Um, thank you for organizing this, Guy Free and Esme and Ash. This has been so wonderful. It's really an honor to be with you all uh, and um, and thank you for always providing places for these kinds of conversations. They're so important and uplifting and I feel like I learned so much as well from all of you. So thank you for, for giving me this space. It really is such an honor for me. Esme, do you have any closing thoughts or announcements? Um, well, we have the links to all of the books uh, mentioned, plus, of course, Unbelonging uh, are in the chat. Uh, and please do get them from, if you don't get them from us, you know, your local indie or wait for it to come to the library. Uh, and definitely read them because they are incredible. Um, thank you both so much. All right. Highly recommend. I am putting these on everybody's must read list. Um, and thank you again, Esme, and thank you, Anjali, for your friendship, for your generosity, for the amazing human you are. Yeah, and, and I just really appreciate you so much. Thank you all. And hopefully we'll, we'll all be together in person at some point, reunion event someday. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got to make that happen. Incredible. Well, Thank you so much, y'all. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.